Hi, my name is Vidita Vaidya, and I'm a professor of neuroscience at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai, India. It's my real pleasure to be part of the storytelling session at the 50th anniversary of the Society for Neuroscience. What I'd like to share with you was a unique and unusual set of challenges and associated failures I ran into when I first set my lab up in 2000 when I moved back home. So it was an exciting time because I was coming back after having spent five years in graduate school in the US and then hop, skip and jump through two postdocs in Europe coming home. And I knew that I was coming home to an institute that was well known for theoretical and experimental physics and math, but perhaps less well so for biology. And certainly I was one of two vertebrate neurobiologists that the institute had just hired. For the kind of work that I do, and I look at circuits that regulate emotion in the brain using rodent models, I knew that one of the things that I have to do is, of course, set up a behavioral facility and get the animal house up and off the ground and running on our campus. And I was excited and wanted to take on this challenge. And so within the first few months of getting the lab up and running and having my first master's student and graduate student join me, we had hired a veterinarian, we had, um, you know, the animal house was beginning to go, we had our, went and got our first set of um, Wistar and Sprague Dolly rats, our C57BL6J mice, and we're getting set to get the approvals to get our first sets of transgenic and mutant animals in, imported from places across the world. It was an exciting time, I was writing grants, things were, you know, buzzing in the lab, there were wonderful young people around, and then we hit an unexpected and utterly absurd roadblock. So as we got our first sets of experiments going, uh, we realized that we might have a challenge at the end of the experiment because we were generating carcasses of animals once we were processing the tissue and taking out the brain. And these carcasses had to be disposed as biomedical waste. And our institute, because it was a theoretical and experimental physics um, associated institute, didn't have an incinerator. And it was impossible to generate one on campus and to build an incinerator at that state. So we were going to have to come up with an alternative way to solve this problem. And so I spoke to um, you know, a lot of hospitals in the southern tip of Mumbai. So I spoke to people at the hospitals. And of course, they were very happy to tell us that there is a biomedical incinerator facility in Suri. And you should be able to tap that and send the tissue there for processing. And so it seemed like a problem that would be solved in a day. Suffice it to say that sometimes the challenges that you that unravel you are the ones you never anticipate. And so I asked the veterinarian whom we'd hired to run our animal house facility to go give it a shot and see if we could get the approvals to send uh, our carcass material and tissue to this um, incinerator facility in Surrey. And he came back looking quite disheartened and said, you know, you might have bitten off more than you can chew. And this is not going to be as straightforward as you seem to think it is. And so I said, no, no, I'm sure we can pull this off. Let's go together. Let's go give this a shot. And just to put it in context, this is in the first few months of getting the lab up and off the ground. Students were excited, buzzing, doing experiments. We'd already had our first rounds of breedings with the animals. We were generating you know, tissue material and doing experiments. And so off we went to uh, the Bombay Municipal Commissioner's building and office, uh, which is where um, the biomedical waste tissue material um, you know, approvals are generated. And then after that, you, of course, go to the biomedical waste facility. And we met the man who was in charge of the biomedical waste disposal in the city of Mumbai. It was very pleasant and he was very nice. But then he told us, what are you trying to dispose? I said, well, it's experimental tissue material because we are doing experiments and we study the brain and we have this biomedical waste that we need to dispose. And he said, well, let me check. And out came a dusty tome from behind his desk and he um, you know, rifled through the pages and said, there's nothing in here that says anything about rats and mice. I'm sorry, this doesn't constitute biomedical waste. I can't do anything about it. There isn't a line in here. And so you're not going to be able to use that facility. And we needed an approval letter from him to be able to go use the facility and we weren't going to get that approval letter. And so we said, well, then what are we supposed to do? Do you have any suggestions? So he said, and very helpfully he said, well, I'll give you the address of the Pret crematorium and perhaps you can try that. And you know, while it did sound quite um, absurd, we were willing to give it a shot. And so we went to the Pet crematorium to see if there was a way that our biomedical waste could potentially be disposed of there and met a very kindly gentleman and a lady who told us, 
of course, we'll look after your requirements and we'd be able to give you the ashes for disposal at the end. At which point in time, the vet and I looked at each other and we realized that, uh, you know, it would be impossible to justify these costs. Uh, I could imagine the audit statement on the on the grants that I had been receiving for our funding at the end of the year saying, you know, we have a large line item that says pet crematorium costs. So this was just not going to happen. So we, of course, came back. And um, in the meantime, experiments couldn't stop because we'd received our first set of funding and, you know, people were buzzing and excited in the lab to do experiments. And so we solved the problem by filling one freezer shelf of our minus 80 freezer saying, okay, we can use one shelf for storage while we figure out a way to resolve this problem. And, I, and I, I told all the trainees in my lab that promise you could get this resolved. It doesn't seem that impossible and it doesn't lo look like such an impossible task. We'll figure it out. And so off I went again with the vet and uh, took a taxi, went off to the commissioner's building, um, went, went in there, met the men, man again. And he said, uh, you know, went to told him, look, this pet crematorium idea that you suggested last time isn't possible for us. Plus some of our animals have paraformaldehyde when we process tissue, because we have to fix the brain. And here we were explaining the science, the experiments in fairly detailed, um, you know, descriptions to this administrative um, officer. And he said, well, I'm very happy to listen to everything you have, but there is still this line on rats and mice still doesn't exist in my book. And unless you can get that changed and these rules modified, I can't sanction that this material actually goes to the biomedical facility at Siori. And so this was now five months later and about six months later after starting the lab and um, so came back and by then, well, we filled the second shelf. And we tried to resolve it in some way or the other, trying to see could we build an incinerator on campus wasn't a possibility, would take years. Uh, by which point in time, you know, I would hit tenure, I would have to, you know, obviously show results for the grants that we had, uh, you know, received. Um, there were students to graduate, there were PhDs to do. This, is, this wasn't a possible solution. The pet crematorium solution was also wiped out. So the only solution we had was literally this fantastic biomedical incinerator facility, if we could only get this one human being at this desk to agree that tissue derived from rats and mice used for experiment is indeed biomedical waste, despite the fact that it wasn't written in that dusty tome of his. And so right back again, we went and um, in the meantime, we had filled the whole freezer. And you know we had generated material here for a full freezer, even though we didn't yet have enough samples for the full freezer, but we were generating material because they take, animals take space and tissue material, disposed tissue material takes space. So we go back to this gentleman, try to explain to him why we need his help, how he would be helping the careers of multiple young graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, including this young faculty member. And it was 2000 and I was a young faculty member then. So I was trying to tell him, look, you know, I'm excited to get this off the ground. We don't really have any vertebrate neuroscience yet at our institute. And we're one of a few, it's a small community of vertebrate neuro mammalian neurobiologists. You'd be helping us if you, you really could change this rule and you couldn't do it. And so off we came back again and bought the second freezer. And now, uh, you know, a chunk of my capital expenditure on the grant that we had received was going to buy freezers. And also the space was limited and now I had to find a home for a second freezer as well. Uh, by which point in time, the students were beginning to realize and my postdocs too were beginning to realize that, you know, this, this whole thing that I said about, we get this, we'll fix this was not fixing itself very quickly. In fact, it was not fixing itself at all. Um, and I was actually fairly embarrassed about this problem because I didn't know how to explain this in any of the grant um, review meetings or review meetings at the institute level. I did mention it a few times saying, I'm running into a challenge that I hadn't expected and I'm failing quite spectacularly to figure out how to resolve the end point of my experiments, not the ability to think of experiments, not the ability to gen generate funding for experiments, not the ability to have incredibly talented, wonderful people in my lab who are all excited to do the experiments. But what do I do with the material at the end of it? How do we solve this biomedical waste related issue? And um, uh, well, people said, we'll help you. And certainly people did try, but you know, we've acquired 
uh, positively uh, unusual level of administrative rules and bells and whistles in our um, uh, commissioner's office. And it was impossible to bend this particular rule very easily. Two years passed, two freezers were bought. Three years passed, three freezers were bought. It was the fourth year, it was the fourth freezer. And it was getting absurd because there was no space left. The entire passageway of the laboratory was now filled with four freezers. There were 10 people in the laboratory. There were several grants. It was, we were thriving and yet we hadn't solved this particular unexpected, unusual challenge. And we were failing rather terribly at being able to persuade this one gentleman to be able to see why we needed his permissions and his approvals to be able to really use the biomedical waste facility in Syria. And frustrating though it was, and um, embarrassing though it was, because it was such an unusual and unique problem that I couldn't really share this with too many other people without it sounding just ludicrous or ridiculous that this was what was derailing some of our stuff. So we went back and by this point in time, multiple cups of tea had been consumed with this gentleman by me and the veterinarian. We had eaten every variant of the biscuits that they had available at his office. Uh, he knew us by name, we knew him by name, we knew his children's names, we knew what they were interested in. He had heard um, you know, almost pretty much all our layman introductions to the science we were doing had been tested on this gentleman in excruciating detail in all possible ways to just persuade him as to why what he would be doing would be important and relevant and why he should make an exception to that tome that he had and write in a line that said it's okay for rodent material and rodent carcasses to be disposed of in the biomedical phase facility, which is largely meant for human tissue in theory. Four years later, four freezers later, at some point I was um, beginning to believe that I would just end up retiring from this campus with perhaps more freezers than any neurobiologist probably in the world had had because I was just not solving this problem. This man bent and made an exception purely based on our pleading. I mean, it, I, I don't know what changed it. And I, if I tell you how we succeeded, I won't be able to because something switched on that particular day when we went and both me and the vet were sitting there and saying, you know, you don't understand what you're doing, why what you're doing is so important and you will make a difference to so many people who come post this first few set of labs that are being set up. And it matters that you are willing to consider and break this rule that isn't written in your rule book. And he said, okay, I'm gonna make an exception. You make an exception because you've been coming so regularly and I'm, I feel terrible that we, uh, you know, you have the situation and I am bending a rule, but I'm gonna put my name on this and sign off on it. And you can go and take these carcasses to the Siri facility as long as you can get them there. I can't sanction a medical waste truck, truck to come to you. It's like, no, 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 don't worry. We will figure it out. We left that room that day um, feeling like we had achieved something surreal. And it just, it just, we couldn't believe that after four years, we'd managed to persuade this one gentleman. Came back to the lab, got a medical waste truck, you know, hired a truck to actually take the carcasses over to the facility. And as we left the gate, we realized that we needed an exit pass for the material that would be leaving the gate. And so this signed off a non-returnable exit pass for material as it exited the Institute. And, you know, so the security guard said, well, this is, um, you know, it's a small truck, but it was a truck nevertheless. And he said, what are you sending out that is not going to come back to the Institute? Because usually when you have a reasonably large amount of material, it's going for repair and it's coming back. So I was explaining to him that, you know, I do research on the brain. This is what I'm interested in. We look at circuits that regulate emotion. This is relevant to disorders like anxiety and depression and schizophrenia. And I realized that a lot of my psychom or attempts to do sort of fledgling science communication had come from my attempt to communicate this successfully to the administrators in the commissioner's building, to um, the security guards who were helping us to get these exit passes done. It was an interesting experience and one I hadn't anticipated. And so he said, okay, uh, we'll let you do this exit pass, but can you tell me that for something to have an exit pass, it must also have an entry pass. It must have entered the Institute at some point, right? And that's when I, the, the, the moment of surreal absurdity at that moment was so much, I burst out laughing and I said, yes, there was an entry pass four years ago 
four years ago, me and my first graduate student who is now left and is uh, actually, interestingly enough, is a young faculty member at UCLA now. Uh, you know, both of us went out and got uh, the first set of animals that came in, but they're the ancestors of these animals who we've done research on and looked at their brains and this is what we do. And so I don't have entry passes for the material that's actually exiting currently. And my language <laughs> communication abilities fell apart because I was doing this in regional local Indian languages. And you know, it was, it, it was testing me and pushing me to, um, to really expand my ability to convey this effectively. But sure enough, he let us go ahead and off this material went and it was, I was still pretty embarrassed about it. I'm not clear why I was so embarrassed, but I felt like I had run into a challenge that I just couldn't solve no matter what I tried. And I was failing so spectacularly for four years and four freezers later, I'd spent a large amount of the capital component of my grant on minus 80 freezers unexpectedly. But it, tells, it's, it turns out that, you know, 21 years later, this is actually a pretty absurd story. And I find myself in the unique position of sharing it at the 50th anniversary for the Society for Neuroscience. I would never have told the younger version of myself that this was ever even possible. But it's worth a good laugh. It's worth a moment to realize that each of us will have our own version of the freezer challenge that I ran into. Mine was um, an absurd little one and none of the vertebrate biologists who've shown up at our campus post that have had to face this challenge because it did solve itself and it's smooth as a whistle now, but it, was, uh, it wasn't smooth as a whistle then. And each of us, as we set up, you know, experiments or write a grant, or we have our own version of a failure that we hit. It's only when we share those over a pint or over a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and laugh at the absurd that we find it possible to keep going and keep, um, you know, keep at it. And so that's the reason to share this. And um, yeah, the younger version of myself would never have believed that this would have been possible. And I'm thrilled that there's this opportunity to share some of the absurd failures that one can run into and the challenges that one faces as one does science. And thank you very much for that opportunity.